Welcome, friends, to the How To Heretic. I am Uncle Mark. And I'm Uncle Dan. And this is your user's guide to life on the outside. That's right. Leaving religion is the first step into a larger, better world. But it can also be a scary world. Hee! Things work differently now. Never fear, that's why we're here. We're your audio uncles, and with help from good friends and much smarter experts than us in all sorts of fields, we're going to share the stories and seek the knowledge to build a great life. After all, you only get one that we know of, so you better make the most of it. Damn Skippy. Yeehaw. Well, Uncle Dan. Uncle Mark. Uh, You're back in the city. Oh my God! You're here. It's great to be sweating it out in a whole new city. Yeah, you're now you're you you've left the uh, the comforts uh, uh, and and happy climes yes. of British Columbia and the and the incredibly abundant and wonderful panoply of Asian food on demand. Right. Uh, back to casserole country, and I couldn't be happier. Indeed. Well, welcome back. We're we're very happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, today we've we've got another fun show. Uh, we will discuss topics, um, uh, weighty and otherwise. Yes, indeed. We're, I, I think we're, I'll start us off with a very odd god. Uh, we'll go to the garden, to the gra- graveyard of the gods, and see, uh, see what, if, see, see what if, we can dig up. What we can dig up. Yeah, and then Uncle Doug is going to introduce a new segment, and uh, I think we're all going to have reason to celebrate. Indeed, and then uh, you and I are going to be taken to school. Yes, our, our very our very good friend Doctor D is going to come back, and uh, we're going to have a very a very good how to. I think. Yeah, I think I think uh, we're going we're going to talk to the, today's all about fertility and uh, and uh, the ha- the having or the not having of it, and and women deciding that maybe they're in charge of their own shit. And women owning their bodies. That's a big one. I know that's a crazy idea, but it's, let's, it's madness. let's do it anyway. Let's, hey, let's just see what happens. Let's do a show. Okay. You know, Uncle Doug. Uncle Mark. We, uh, uh, we occasionally find ourselves uh, uh, at, at the great, great cemetery of the beyond. And today is just such a day. That uh, that uncle, da, uncle uncle whoever you are Dan <laughs> has exhumed some some long forgotten bones that we we're going to take a look at today and we uh, got to be careful we're getting down to like fifty or sixty thousand graves left to, to rob <laughs> yeah the garden of the the graveyard of the gods is uh, uh there's still plenty <laughs> yeah well, I, we have not literally scratched the surface <laughs> right indeed uh, so yeah today here's the thing. Mm. The god that I'm exhuming today may or may not actually be a god. We don't know a lot All right. about what I'm about to talk well, about. Well, probably but, isn't really a god, but may have been but one. Nobody's, <laughs> yes, none of, the, none of the gods were ever gods. Right. There has never been a god that nope. I know of. Nope. Uh, but it might be someday. But my, pff, it could be us. Right. You never know. Wow. Uh, right? Did I blow your mind? Well, that gives me a lot to think about. <laughs> I, you know what? I don't know that I'm up to it. I, just, I know I'm not up to it, but, you know, I'll try. Yeah. I'll try anything once. Uh, I don't know if I'm up to inventing that much exciting juvenile cancer. I just, <laughs> you know. You know what? That's the part of it that I really believe in you on. Really? That's the okay. part that I really have confidence that you You know what? Do. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Like, you'll, I, you'll was, be that like, was very affirming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. I can do this. You can do this. <laughs> You're like arm hair cancer. Let's try that. I don't know. <clears throat> um, Lollipop cancer. There you go, Junior. <laughs> Die miserably. I am God. <laughs> okay. So the the people, the person that I'm going to be talking about uh, is Sheila Nagig. Now, Sheila Nagig, you might think, I don't know. She was in Wild Wild Country. <laughs> no. She was the Rajneeshi, like, uh, Adolf Eichmann. That's yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she uh, would probably nod to that, yeah, to that description that's true. of her. That's yep. true. Different Sheila. Okay. Uh, Sheila Nagig uh, is actually of probably, well, okay, originally probably Spanish slash Portuguese origin. Oh. But Iberian. We find the bulk of Sheila Nagig in England and Ireland, in oh. the UK and, and Ireland. So the greater kind of Celtic, Gaelic uh, yeah. world. Yes, indeed. Right. Uh, so, 
but but strangely no and okay. that's so here's where we run into a problem nobody knows what the fuck she is okay uh there are many people who are theorizing about what she is where she comes from what her origin story is uh what we all know for sure is that in a whole shit ton of churches like christian churches hmm. uh 12th century's church, you know, 11th century, a whole shit ton of these things have Sheila Nagig on them. What? Also, castles, non-religious buildings, all of these. And I, I'm go- what I'm going to have to do is show you guys some Google images of Sheila. Because, and I'm going to tell you what we're looking at. It looks like, oh. I would say, oh. it's E.T., with her vagina out, uh, Ooh. it an exaggerated vagina <laughs> right. that she herself wow. is prying open for all to see. Okay, but let's talk about her face for a second. <laughs> yeah, that to me is like the that to me is like a child's first attempt at sculpting E. T. Right. <laughs> or it is Kermit the Frog was born very prematurely. <laughs> um, I think you got it. It's basic. It's you, the, it's ba- it's a it's an a, a, almost a stick figure face. Yeah, I know. Uh, it looks like a young uh, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions the Third. There you go. Je- it, Jeff Sessions showing his vagina <laughs> to the world. A larval, a larval <laughs> Jeffer, Jefferson Beauregard <laughs> Sessions. <laughs> yeah. um, sometimes she's depicted kind of as an old lady. Sometimes she's depicted, uh, like, you can see her ribs. A lot of the times you can see her ribs. Very rarely do you see breasts. But the the one defining figure thing that you see in all of these is a gaping uh, vulva. A walk-in vagina. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she, and she is excited about it. Uh, this is a two-car vagina. This is yeah. with with room for your tools well, as well. What's fascinating about that is because I, you know, I studied a lot of primitivism in 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 art school before I dropped out of it, but, right? And have kind of been interested in it ever since. Thus, part of the reason we do this bit of the podcast, sure. But fetish symbols, especially female fertility fetish symbols, always include other parts of the feminine form. Right. They almost always include large breasts. They always yep. almost always include large hips. Yeah. Uh, strangely enough, many of them never have any facial features because who the fuck cares? They're for making babies, right? Right. Uh, so this is entirely different. Yeah, this is she way has different. This super weird face. Well, yeah. No other feminine attributes and just a uh, a a high capacity baby deployment system. So when well, you say that, yeah, but I'm going to take issue. Okay, because when academics look at her, a lot of time, a lot of them that have said have posited that they come from that she comes from a fertility sort of thing. Hmm. But she is never shown with, very rarely shown with breasts. Sometimes, yeah. but very rarely shown with breasts, and never with a child. Oh, so it seems to me that that's a bad. Uh, the 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 that oh. this is not a fertility god. Now there are dozens of theories about who Sheila is. Sheila Nagig is a Celtic, I believe, um, term, and the name comes. We there is there's as much question about what where the name comes from mm-hmm. as as there are theories about what she is. A lot of people theorize that it is from the uh, from the Gaelic, oh, where is it? Well, now I've lost it. I've got twelve different things open about her. Anyway, uh, it could mean it could mean, it, any number of things. We don't actually even know what the name means, right? Um, a lot of the a lot. Some people theorize that it's um, Julia of the breasts or the something breasts, and like pff, that doesn't make any sense because she never got tits. Like the whole thing is everybody that has a theory about this. The, yeah, the old hag of the breasts. They think it's it is one of the possible translations. That's nice, <laughs> but she doesn't have any, so that doesn't make any sense. Some people think it's, and I would try to pronounce the uh, the Irish. It, a lot of these names they they theorize are from Irish. Yeah. Um, so the Sheila might be uh, something that in Irish is spelled S I with a little f- over it L E or S I L A. Huh. 
Um, Julia of the breasts is one possible thing. Uh, also, uh, they might think that it's uh, from the Irish uh sheila on her hunkers i don't know what that could possibly mean for, uh, oh that could be from the because she's kind of in a squatting position right? yeah got her haunches kind of a yeah thing. Hunkered no, down. Uh, no matter where her name comes from uh she is a, a little baffling when you see her on a christian church and yeah. is there any explanation of why though that she was in, i mean well so a, the christians borrowed of course everything right it is, there isn't an original idea in the whole shebang but they Christianize them, right? And so, right. and th- she is obviously not Christianizable, <laughs> other, no, th- other than so a lot. So some academics have put forward the notion, and you won't be surprised to learn that this is the idea from men, <laughs> like male, ac- <laughs> like two prominent male academics, especially um, have have theorized that she is a uh, a sort of warning against lust. A Christian warning against lust. She seems kind of sinister, you know? I think she looks happy in most of the images. She looks but, but happily goofy, sinister. Goofy, and she's like, here, put something in me, I is my theory. Uh, you know, Just Christians are super down with that idea. Well, that's the we'll thing. carve it onto their cathedrals. So, so Anthony Weir and James German uh, wrote a book called Images of Lust, and they talk about uh, uh, Sheila Nagig as being a uh, sort of a warning about how lustful women are going to get you. Mm. Which, that would be consistent with Christianity, certainly. Right. But you think she would be, there would be what would be considered attractive attributes rather than kind of a bald tadpole, right? Or yeah. you'd think that there would be like an image of her and then an image of a male being tormented or something bad happening. Like, right. she doesn't look like there's any negative consequence. She's just there with her vagina out. So, other theories, I think, are more plausible. Inclu- so, she could be a Celtic slash pagan uh, holdover. Yeah. A-, a nod to a god that we have now lost. And this seems plausible to me, that there is a... The- the- when the Christians started to build their churches and stuff, the locals were like, yeah, sure, but let's put Sheila up on there just for fun and shits and giggles. You know, they're the ones being told that they have to carve these imagery, this imagery for the for these churches. So they just put their own guy in there, too, and they put, you know, their own lady in there. And I mean, and if, if anything, you know, even on Notre Dame, there's demons carved, not yeah. just the gargoyles, but in, in the porticos, there's demons carved, and, and they look... To me, she's more reflective of a demon because of the the rib cage uh, and the the unhealthy genital size, you know, having something to do with ill health or sickness. But I don't know. I'm she's just another white guy theorizing here. Guys. She's almost always smiling, and that to me, like, I find her adorable. I think she's <laughs> so fucking cute in most of the images that you see of her. She's just funny and and cute and uh, and just wants. To get laid would is you, what it looks like to me. Would you think she was cute if she was hiding under your bed? I mean, you know, there have been times <laughs> in my life when uh, that might have been great. That's why Dan just, never <laughs> turns the black light off. So you can see <laughs> if little mud flapped vagina hobgoblins are creeping around under the bed. <laughs> so, uh, so then, so there are also, um, you know, once women were allowed to theorize about things that happened in centuries past new theories started to prop propagate uh-huh. um, including those again the fertility goddess idea was it has been put forward but she just never has a kid hmm. so and she never and she very rarely has breasts and if they do they're sort of secondary they're not yeah and she's so unlike everything else that was kind of right right fertility goddess so or, there's or there's there's just the idea of just the goddess uh which is just sort of a you know this loosely structured notion that you know there's the the sacred feminine or something like that yeah frankly i just think which mostly you know catholicism banished except for a wee little bit with mary absolutely i i am f- after reading and you know 
more than just the like at least two more than just the Wikipedia articles. Mm-hmm. I went read at least two more. Holy uh, shit! I know. I went pretty. F- I like went deep. PhD level research right, in today's world. Right. You're throwing off the curve here, Dan. <laughs> I'm thinking. I, to me, I'm guessing that it's uh, that this is an imposition on onto Christianity rather than something that the Christians were doing themselves. Mm. Uh, Purposefully hiding a little joke, you think? You think the something local like stone that, or, or 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 just keep a, maintaining a bit of the local culture, the local the local folk religion, while they're you know because in medieval being... France there could not have been a penalty for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Chipping a little pagan joke into the cathedral. <laughs> What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> but this kind of this kind of thing did happen. I mean, we know, like, I mean, you talk about Christianity sort of absorbing, yeah. uh, pagan r- rituals and you know, Easter and and Christmas being uh, just pagan rituals that they kind of just absorbed. Right. Well, I don't know that it was that was a nefarious thing on the part of the Christians. That was people who had practiced this thing for centuries. Now we're Christians, but we're not going to stop practicing our our. Our pagan yeah, fun for time. sure. It was a two-way we're just street. Gonna, we're yeah, just going yeah. to call it something different. We're going to start, you know, moving some things around. I think that that's what this is. Is just mm. uh, they just started to put these uh, these ladies up on the thing. I don't know. I just love her. She's like my favorite thing. I think she's so adorable. Well, and I could I could see your your idea that this was like the pagans that were chiseling the cathedrals dropped this in there because it's part of their culture. I could also see see it being a little bit of a fuck you. Because yeah. it is, you know, to a Christian mind in the in the fifteenth century, what could be more grotesque and and vulgar and and dis, you know disrespectful than a a girl holding open her vagina? Right, but you would think that like somebody somewhere along the line would get in trouble for this. Right, instead of there being hundreds of them scattered all oh, over the true. countryside. Yeah, that's amazing, yeah. because a woman, and we, boy, this is kind of a theme in this show a bit. A, a woman. Uh, expressing sexuality on her own terms, if that's exact, if that's indeed what she's doing, was not really a thing. And it was the wor- like the most abhorrent thing, right? Yeah. To the to that mind, right? Yeah. So to me, this this is a poke in somebody's eye. Yeah. This, right. but it's also it looks to me like a celebration. This mm-hmm. looks to me like a like there was a culture there that was all about. Uh, pussy for for lack of but like in in a positive non-procreative playful way yeah and uh and and uh and they squeaked one they squeaked one under the door yeah they they just they just held on to it they were just yeah "Eh, let's keep her well that's pretty cool i mean you know we saw when doug and i went to cusco in peru we saw in the in the big cathedral there and you know the the conquistadors were not very nice to the indians when they showed up indeed and uh, there was a, there's a giant painting there, which I found fascinating, that they allowed them this much license of the Last Supper. And it's, it's all Christian, uh, it's all uh, European-looking apostles sitting around a table, except for Judas, who was painted very much as a local. Uh, but <laughs> the food of the feast is all, America, is all native to the Americas. Right. So the main course is a guinea pig, and they're eating peppers and melons. Cheeseburgers and, and uh, <laughs> fried chicken. Exactly. Popeye's <laughs> fried chicken. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, I wonder if it's in the same spirit of like, okay, we'll allow you a local, a little dash of local Imagine spice. Like, all right, look, here's the deal. We'll let you have one thing. <laughs> and you know, the, in that painting, they're like, okay, we're going to put our local food here. Great. Yeah. What do you want to do? I, well, stretched out vagina. Imagine the, the two things that they put forward before they allowed them to keep this one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what those would have been, but... Oy, oy, oy. Oy, oy. Well, what a fascinating journey into a strange little fragment of something we know very little about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I wish I could give like more concrete information, but... I just love that she exists, and I wanted everyone to know about <laughs> this little alien lady with her vagina. Check yeah. under your beds for Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's put her back in the ground, which maybe she never came from, and uh, yeah, and let's move on. Okay. Uncle Dan. Yes, sir. Uncle Uncle Mark. Can I just point out something? Yeah. I love having us all in the same room. We have a quorum in the same room for the first time in six months. Yeah, six months. It's yeah. been so long. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we've got Uncle Doug here. We've got Uncle Dan and Uncle Mark all in the same room, looking at each other. 
awkwardly. Uh, we have the the uncles three. So <laughs> so here we are, the Trinity, the unholy Trinity of yeah. of uh, minor internet podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, it's we have reason beyond that to celebrate. We do. Yes, there are holidays all the fucking time. In <laughs> every day's a holiday somewhere. Here, well, and here in this state of Utah, yeah, uh, which is the state in which we all reside, yeah, uh, the the Mormons who founded this state got to this valley, the Salt Lake Valley, theoretically, yeah, uh, in July. That's mm-hmm. right, and we celebrate that ingress of people by uh, having parades and fireworks and all sorts of stuff in July, which we already did. For the 4th of July for Indo- American independence, but oh, what the fuck, we'll just keep going. That's right. So on, on July 24th, 1847, a, a, a bunch of white-ass motherfuckers showed up, and, and a couple slaves, let's, not, That's let's right. not lie to ourselves, showed up in this valley of our births, and, uh, and we, for some reason, celebrate that. On the 24th of July. But that invasion of Ute territory by that's right, they, white Americans. They were not exactly the first people here, but they were the ones with the guns. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and this set, we were starting a new segment because we decided uh, from such humble beginnings with Pioneer Day in Utah that it was worth exploring the origins of so many holidays around the world. It, it, these are the, you know, the, the origin of the word is Holy Day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, Uncle Doug is here to talk to us about... Utah's holiest That's of right. holy days, uh, and and you know for those that do not live in the state of Utah, this is this is coming as I'm sure complete unknown uh, information. <laughs> Fireworks go on sale, I think, coast to coast on like what mid June, sure, and then Something stop like being sold on July Fourth across the country, right? Where in places that are not burning, which are getting fewer and fewer, right? Um, but in Utah, those sales just continue, yeah, through the rest of the month of July until. July 24th, which, as Uncle Mark said, is the day that Brigham Young led the first group of pioneers into the Salt Lake Valley. Right. Um, and this, this you know, spools back a little bit to 1844 when, when Joseph Smith was killed in Missouri. The Brigham Young ascended to the throne of the Mormon religion. According to <laughs> that group of Mormons. Exactly. Not all of them. But yeah, a whole there was a whole subset that decided that that wasn't real Mormonism and went a different direction, a, a but, very different direction. But, but but by far the the largest body, yep, uh, did that, and yes. and the the polygamist body was the one that came west. Oh, right. that's true. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Brigham Young uh, laid plans from 1844 to 1846 to S- bring the saints. Super nice guy. Just super, a sweetheart. Super good guy. <laughs> as, as, as we shall shortly see. Okay. Fond of bees. Strangely <laughs> right. fond of bees. It's yeah. An odd thing to like. Um, I mean, I like bees. No, normally a positive trait in a person. Yeah, yeah. I like a good bee. <laughs> I, like, I like me a bee on a hot summer day. <laughs> sure. Who doesn't like a good bee? <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you got a bonnet, have a bee. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that means, right? <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> That's right. As far as I know. Um, so Brigham Young led the first group of pioneers to the Salt Lake Valley in 1847 um, in what would become called the Mormon Exodus. And it was basically the exit of the vast majority of the Mormons from the Midwest, from Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois. Um, and they all came out here west to the Salt Lake Valley, which at the time was inhabited, but very sparsely so by U- the Ute Indians. Um, basically Brigham Young wanted a space that nobody else wanted because they had been harried mm. and, and, and had not had a good time in any of the places they'd, they'd, they'd settled. Let's just, let's just, but we can, we can agree that they participated in the harry. Oh, the, yes. Far from innocent. <laughs> yes. There was mutual harriage. <laughs> yes, exactly. Including like the murderous kind. Yeah. yeah. All of their problems stemmed from the fact that there were other people there. Yeah. Right. right. So, and they did. So, I mean. Kudos to them. They came up with an actual solution to that problem, which is just go to where nobody yes. is. Yeah. Which at the time was not the United States. They Correct. left the country. Right. Intentionally so. Um, they to, v- to Mexico. They were in Mexico. Here in lovely Mexico. That's right. They were they were undocumented immigrants to Mexico. Let's Ooh. just let's just yeah. They were yeah. illegal. Yeah. Immigrants they just to crossed Mexico. the border. Didn't it, didn't ask anybody's permission. Just left. Yep. Right. It helps when you bring guns, and that's not a lesson that should be repeated today. But it <laughs> right. certainly worked for them. Um, yeah, and they. I mean, they they massively misread Western expansion of the United States, but they did assume when they got here that they would be living in their own own country. They were the MS thirteen of the eighteen forties. <laughs> is what you're saying. MS-47. 
So uh, in the, the totality of the Mormon Exodus, there are several stories. It was a harrowing journey of 1,300 miles from the, from the Mississippi River, wherever on that river you started your journey, to the Salt Lake Valley. It was long and hard and arduous at the best of times, and not all of these parties that came across the plains were equally uh, provisioned or wealthy. Right, um, or up to the task. Or up to the task. Or, or really, yeah, or had any true understanding of what lie ahead. It yeah. Was, oh, yeah. It was a super shitty. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. But there is in that, uh, to, you know, that this went on until basically the 19th century, the 20th century, there were still, uh, even when the Transcontinental Railroad was in place, there, yeah. were, there were Mormon immigrants that were too poor to buy tickets oh. that still trekked on foot oh, to God. the Salt Lake Valley. Can you imagine? Just watching the train go you by. You are just pulling all your junk, your fucking <laughs> butter churn and your whalebone corset and your... <laughs> And me- meanwhile, <laughs> blowing by Just you. the clink of martini glasses <laughs> by a tr- tr- in the Doppler. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, all right. So in amongst the, the all of the pioneers that came across, the, the most wretched and terrible and poor um, and sad were the handcart pioneers. Mm-hmm. And outside of Mormon religion- Asterisk, and- there were slaves, but go on. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, outside of Utah and outside of Mormon lore and religion and people who like us who've escaped it, this is this is a story and a, and a uh, legend or myth that is just unknown. But basically, what happened in in the the Mormons started flooding into the valley. Brigham Young set himself up as a dictator, no doubt, yeah. no fooling. I, I benevolent dictator. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. Now, in, you're, it, it's important to distinguish the handcart pioneers from the other pioneers, yes, because. The the upper class pioneers or the yeah. more righteous, because as we know, Mormons are very uh, very much adhere to a form of the prosperity doctrine. Right. right. They had you you know, what would certainly be miserable by today's standards, <laughs> but they had covered wagons mm-hmm. and, and ox. animals. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, being pulled by by horses or, or oxen and yep. very few people were on foot. Yes. You know, yeah. so it was a better way yeah. right, to pioneer. So oh. uh, absolutely. So uh there was a disastrous harvest in 1855 and 56 in Utah, and and the church, the Utah culture, uh, fell into very hard times. And Brigham Young still wanted people to come. He didn't want to. He didn't want to end the influx of immigrants. We have no food. Quick, more people. Get in here. Uh, it gets so much worse. So, uh, the the whole handcart pioneer project went from 1856 to 1860. It was a small window oh. of time. Okay. So and it, so the 47 nights weren't no weren't handcarters. They the Brigham Young was here. He wanted more people. He didn't care how poor you were. You know what? Pull your own fucking cart. Right. Get in here. Yeah. So what, near, do you, what, what do you got? A sheep and a dog? You just put, hook them up. That's do luxury. whatever you got to do. Right. So almost the totality of the handcart pioneers were actually from England, Wales, Scotland, and oh, Scandinavia. Right. Um, uh, there were those about, bastards. Yeah. Right. There were about three thousand of them that made this journey in the handcarts and in ten different handcart companies over the course of those four years. Three thousand, wow. Yeah. It's quite a few. Um, the trek was disastrous for two of the companies, which we will get to, uh, because they started so dangerously late and were caught in the heavy snow um in Wyoming. Uh so despite a sizable rescue effort launched from the Salt Lake Valley d- when these these companies got stuck, uh more than two hundred and ten out of the nine hundred and eighty pioneers in those two companies died. Jesus. Which is an astounding Yikes. mortality rate, even Jesus. for that journey. Right. Yeah, that's it. I'm, and that journey, you know, the, we should mention that in Mormon lore, in the way uh-huh. when, when Mormons talk about this trek, yeah. this is the Exodus. This yeah. is Moses yeah. taking the whole, the Jews right. out of Egypt into, into freedom and into prosperity. And, uh, and but they also talk about how harrowing it was and how uh, you know the death rate was just abysmal and blah right. blah blah because it was just so you know and that's largely not true yeah. like it was largely just fine yeah except for some of these right these groups that were set out at the wrong time yep like Made sure that they hit winter in exactly the worst place you could possibly and, hit winter. And something that's a, a, a bit shit about their whole mythology of this, too, is they think they have a patent on Pioneer. Right, yeah. right, right, right. The the history of the world since we started navigating the waterways or even right. long before that 
<laughs> was people moving their asses from one valley to another, to another, to another. Right. right. Uh, certainly in North America, when white people got here and said, hey, we, we've got antibodies, you don't. We've got guns, you don't. It was a land grab. Right, right. And all people moving in all directions at all times. So yes, Mormons, it was a hot, long walk. But it, it was not exclusive to you. In fact, yeah. the, the, the fact of the matter is that the, the journey from Utah and Salt Lake and then, and then Cedar City, uh, which is in southern Utah, became the last stops for the California traveling pioneers of America, not Mormons, um, on what would be the worst part of the journey. Right. From, from Cedar City through the Sierra Nevada to, to California was the worst part of right. this entire journey. The 49ers, still is. the 49ers, it still is. <laughs> right. They did the whole exactly. fucking Mormon trek and then they kept going. And kept going. Like, yeah, well, exactly. You stay with Mormons for, you know, a day or two and then suddenly you're like, mm, California right. sounding pretty good. You know what? Death Valley, I think I can do this. I, I think <laughs> I can handle it. <laughs> it's October, I'm going through Donner Pass. <laughs> well, so, in, and, and part of the reason that, that all of these immigrants were influxing from um, England and Scotland, Wales, Scandinavia, this was literally right around the same time. I mean, it was 1848 when uh, Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto based on what he saw in industrialized London. Right. Mm. I mean, it was just hell. Yeah. Right. So to, to, uh, the promise of however harrowing the journey, the promise of the destination being open land and a fate not controlled by a meatpacking company right. was attractive. Yeah. And so these people would- and, and not for nothing, the Irish potato famine was in 1847. Yeah. So it was not a place to, not a fun place to be back then. Never, never really at all prior right. to that. But the potato <laughs> famine made it a little less potato right. So uh, motivated by uh, the need for more labor and population in Utah, his towering ego, coupled with utter contempt for anyone who was not himself or some poor sixteen-year-old Mormon girl he wanted to bed, and with some good old-fashioned uh, American religious fervor mixed in for good measure, Brigham Young ordered these European pioneers to build these handcarts and come to Utah. Now, the handcarts, interestingly, were by Brigham Young's own design. Oh, boy. So they were, they were very specific. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he came up with the idea, and I, he designed them himself. I guess I kind of thought that it was more of a sort of just a thing that was happening no, at the time. because no one would do it. Because why so would you? It's so bananas to think of, like, well, I'll just pull it. <laughs> I'll, just, like, no. I'll just put all of my possessions into this wagon, right? and off we go. And so the, the, it, it was very specifically designed. It was uh, the handcarts looked like basically a you know we know what they look like because they're all over Mormon culture but they're basically a giant wheelbarrow. Um, they have five foot wheels. Um, they uh, a single axle, four and a half feet wide. They could carry. They weighed about sixty pounds. They had two seven foot uh, posts going off the front with a three foot crossbar. It's like a little rickshaw kind of looking. It's totally yeah, like yeah, a little yeah, rickshaw. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With um, two with the two wheels are sort of right centered in, yep. uh, on the thing, so that the weight is distributed or whatever. Exactly. And then uh, there was a, it, the cargo was carried in a box about three by four feet with eight inch walls. So that is your cargo. That's it. Right. That's you are carrying your family and everything you need in that little box. And, yeah, and, and you're pulling it, and the food, and the, and and at the time, everything was made out of cast iron, oh and wool, and yeah, you know, yeah. What's that's if what's funny about that is the first iterations of the handcarts were 100 percent wood, mm. and so they just you know, fell apart, fell apart, yeah. And the construction, so they didn't have like a, a hoop, like an iron hoop, not the, the wheel. first oh. that when this will play into the story, not the first uh, five of the ten. Um, expeditions had anything but wood. Oh uh, my god! And when they built like them, the axle was a wooden. Everything th was wood. Wow! So the things would just fly to pieces. Yeah. How do, how do you bump. even grease that? I well, that, that, <laughs> it's very good. There's a point in the story. We'll talk where about they, it off the air. Okay. There's, a way to, <laughs> there's a way to do it. <laughs> but it's, you're not going to like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Involves killing a horse every seven you, miles. You can't unsee what I'm going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> And in some cases, they would actually, uh, they, if they can build them badly, they built them, build them out of green wood, which mm. wasn't fully dried, so it made it even worse. Right. These were just terribly defective. The design was terrible. The idea was terrible. It's odd for yeah. Jesus' best friend on earth and the <laughs> prophet, seer, revelator, and man with power of discernment right. to design a defective buggy. Exactly. You, yeah, you wouldn't... You know what? Here's what's funny. So I grew up with two Mormon historians as my parents. Oh. My dad worked as a curator in the LDS Church <laughs> History Museum. Oh, that, no that was super fun. <laughs> Discussions around the dinner table. Actually, they're both very liberal. You know, it was actually really cool. Like, I loved 
I loved talking about history, but I'll tell you this. You didn't hear, like, and at the museum, you wouldn't see uh, discussions of, like, the bullshit carts. Right. You saw the triumphant right. final design. Yeah. And you saw, like, yeah, I mean, like, you saw them proudly displaying the odometer that Orson somebody had invented that oh. actually kept track of the rotations of the thing, and look, they knew how far they had gone, and, uh, like, all of these things, but, yeah, it doesn't sound like they, the the initial idea. You don't hear was, about the uh, Brigham Young unsafe at any speed right. uh, handcart recall the, of the Pinto of the of the Pioneer World eighteen fifty five. Why are they exploding? I can't even. Un- <sighs> Gasoline isn't even a thing. <laughs> so uh, there were five people assigned to each handcart, which wasn't always the case. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, the individuals were limited to seventeen pounds of personal effects, including clothing. Wow. Uh, and there were accompanying, in almost every case, there was an ox wagon or two accompanying. In the 1850s, the, uh, that 17 pounds of clothing is what a woman wore to bed. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. how in the world did they exactly. manage with yeah. that? So after three successful handcart companies completed the journey from Nebraska and Iowa to Utah um, in 1856, two more companies prepared to set out. However, because this is the 1880s or 1800s, none of the feedback... Of, of those three first journeys made it back to this next two, <laughs> including you should make the edges of your wheels and your axles out of metal. Yeah. So they figured that out, but this other company, there was no way to get word to them. So <laughs> I, I, wonder, I wonder when that third company noticed just the heaps of busted hand carts and right, exactly. skeletons all along. <laughs> well, <laughs> the problem is once you set out, you're, you're committed. Like, yeah, you, you, know, gotta, yeah, you don't leave the cart al- on the side of the road. You fix it. You yep, have to yeah. build a new one or whatever. Um, also, we should paint a picture here because a lot of this journey goes across prairie land. and Yeah, just sort of, most definitely. But then you get to sort of mid-Colorado. And you hit the Rockies. And you yeah. hit the Rocky Mountains, and it's fucking alpine. Yeah. Like, good luck. Yeah, no yeah. doubt. You are climbing mountains over and down and over and yeah. down and over and down. On a rickety wooden rickshaw that you're pulling. Like an idiot. family in it. Like yeah. an idiot. Who, who doesn't stop before the mountains? Right. Yeah, Just I'd be like, well, this is good. Yeah, look Colorado's at this. Colorado's nice. Yeah, look, <laughs> look at all this. Um, uh, the, so the Willie Company left on August 17th and the Martin Company left 10 days later. Um, uh, two ox wagon trains followed the Martin Company with provisions. Hmm. Um, so again, it bears repeating the oh. Donner Party. So there would there would be some oxen with supplies with these handcart companies. Oh, um, uh, but as we'll see, not nearly enough. Hmm. Um, the Donner Party disaster yeah. happened in 1847, 1848, yeah, and okay. w- and it happened you know not in in these environs. They they came through they came through the Salt Lake Valley less than a year before right. the Mormon pioneers settled. Right. Yeah. So and th- the and idea of leaving too late was a well known right problem. Right. We so. should just mention that the Donner Party didn't end well. It was not a good party. It was it was among <laughs> history's worst potlucks. Let's just, <laughs> and we'll we'll talk about that another show. Yeah, you can <laughs> Google that if you want to. Uh. So uh, in early October, they, both parties reached Fort Laramie, Wyoming, where they were expected to be restocked and provisioned. But again, because of Brigham Young's incredible logistical skills, no provisions were stocked for them there. <laughs> um, the companies had to start cutting back their food ra- uh, rations, hoping that their supplies would last and they could get help from Utah. So already they're off to a terrible start. Yeah. Uh, they lightened their loads down to 10 pounds per person, discarding anything extra, um, including, very stupidly, blankets and coats. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so oh, boy. yeah, I, I don't uh, think we're gonna need these. Are we gonna need these? <laughs> um, what time of year was this? This was now we're hitting not October. Oh no! Oh and, goodness! And uh, the Mormons in Salt Lake realize that shit's about to hit the fan, so they actually do put together a pretty sizable rescue operation. But again, terribly operated and terribly carried out. Um, they sent out uh, four mule teams with twenty-seven men, uh, sixteen wagon loads of food and supplies. Um, but inevitably the storms came, the, the, um, two wagon trains were coming from, uh, the, the East and the Utah Mormons heading from the West, both got caught in winter storms in October and brought to a standstill. Mm. Um, and then the stories, uh, and, and you guys remember some of these stories from when we were kids about pulling these wagons through, you know, knee and waist deep snow in blizzards, fully exposed over the Rocky mountains. 
Those are those are mostly true stories. It was hell, right? Disastrous and and unnecessary hell because they just started in at the wrong time. No need for this to happen, right? None at all. Um, Just that, just that Brigham Young decided he needed a solid underclass in Utah. Right. Stat. Right. Right. And probably a a pool of new possible wives. Right. Right. Um, the, eventually in, in November, both, uh, uh, the rescue parties actually reached both the handcart companies, um, and started to re- resupply them, which they would have to do several times because they had to carry the supplies with them. So they didn't have enough supplies to fully provision these handcart companies. So the rescue parties would provision them and that would get them another 50 miles. Oh, and they had Jesus. to head back to Salt Lake, load up again and do it all again. <laughs> they can't just. Put a bunch of them on the wagons. I I think it, I think it was pretty limited. <laughs> wow. Um. The the Wiley Company. Let's see. Uh, the Wiley Company arrived in Salt Lake City on November 9th with 68 members of the company that lost their lives. Jesus. On November 18th, the backup party met the Martin Company, um, and got them their supplies at least. And then all the members were able to actually ride the wagons back. Um. And 104 wagons had to carry the Martin Companies into Salt Lake City on November 30th. And 145 members of their party died. Jesus. And most of the rest of the members of both parties lost fingers and toes. Well, you don't need all your fingers and toes. <laughs> Small price to pay for whatever. For, for living in a high desert hellscape with, right. a, with a dictator. And you guys remember, this, is this, this story, I, you might remember uh, of them when we were kids, they would always tell the story about these three 18-year-olds who went and carried a bunch of people across a frozen river. Do you remember that story? No, I don't. I don't uh, it's 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 really popular in Mormon lore, and it goes: the three eighteen-year-old boys belonging to the relief party came to the rescue, and to the astonishment of all who saw, carried nearly every member of that ill-fated handcart company across the snowbound stream. The strain was so terrible, and the exposure so great that in later years, all the boys died from the effects of it. When President Brigham Young That's heard not this, how cold works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Four years later, <laughs> you don't die of hypothermia. You contracted twenty four years earlier. That's not how that works. And they passed it on to their children. Yeah, this is bullshit. Um, they, they caught a bad case of the river weeks. <laughs> They're weak now. I did something really hard in my when I was eighteen, and now I'm dead at thirty. <laughs> For fuck's sake! Uh, when President Brigham Young heard of this heroic act. He wept like a child and later declared publicly, this act alone will ensure that Alan C. Huntington, oh, sorry, C. Allen Huntington, George W. Grant, and David P. Kimball, an everlasting salvation in the celestial kingdom of God, worlds without end. Does that mean that they can commit sins, sort of carte blanche? <laughs> right. Well, also, that, I, I, I like that idea. It's like, okay, first of all, the story's not even true. Right. right. Maybe they died of in their so. exercises yeah. or something. Yeah. They got frostbite or hypothermia or something. But, but I love that he is... Basically forgiving himself for the negligent... <laughs> that is exactly what he's doing. negligent homicide yeah. <laughs> of these three young men, yeah. uh, and, and, however and, delayed. This makes no fucking and, sense. And there's no eyewitness accounts at the time of these three boys doing all this work. I mean, there were heroic efforts by these rescue parties. Sure. And as a guy who wouldn't miss a meal to save a starving wagon train, I can't, like, you know, disparage the courage of someone <laughs> who would do anything. Yeah, I wouldn't miss a meal to put, a, put out a fire in my own house. <laughs> <laughs> So, again, although the blame for this falls squarely on the shoulders of Brigham Young, right. no doubt about it, it, he conceived the idea, he designed the carts, he ordered the trains to leave, um, the, a tremendous amount of effort was made and is still being made to exonerate him and blame everybody else. Right. Right. And, and this is, you know, they had plenty of experience with oxen hauling shit across the frontier. Right. So they, had, they probably had some, you know, R&D about how you make a better wheel how you did yeah. how many oxen yeah. you need how many miles you can travel how much water you need but this like these hand carts with these prairie rickshaws totally untested yeah exactly it was so you just threw families in them yeah the poorest families to the drag poorest. these things across the yeah continent. yeah it's ridiculous it's, and, i mean can you imagine the journey the i mean from liverpool or you know wherever in scandinavia yeah. To the, the, the dangerous journey across the Atlantic, the dangerous journey to get to the Rockies, and then like, well, here's your last leg of the journey. Yeah. Here's best, your, here, best of luck to you. Here's your payment for your credulous simplicity. Right. Yeah. And look, I've been to Liverpool. The most dangerous part of that journey was probably from your house to the port. <laughs> <laughs> it is not cool. So, And then you get to the Rockies, and they're like, have you ever heard of balsa wood? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so there were five more um, uh, handcart companies that left uh, uh, the next year and the next year. 
Um, almost no fatalities. They they actually left in plenty of time. Oh, uh, so were they well did provisioned. Learn. They did learn. They did learn for those last five, and then the whole that whole thing was wrapped up in 1860 and never attempted again. Now, if you if you dear listener are curious about this whole strangeness, there is a fetishized version of the handcart journey that you can come witness here every year, right? Every every yeah. summer in yeah. Salt Lake City. Oh my God! <clears throat> lots of Mormon families do what, like a three night excursion, two they, night they, excursion. They call it trek. Yeah. yeah, it's called Trek. It's right. There's actually, they, somebody just made a movie about it. Right. Uh, ju- that was just in local theaters like a couple months ago. Like a documentary or like a dramatized? No, like, like a dramatized movie about people reenacting the Trek. <laughs> you, <laughs> Not about the actual Trek, like, about the reenactment. That's like watching a movie about a sea- Civil War reenactment mm-hmm. of the Battle of Gettysburg. So Correct. You will probably hear one or more of us talking about this in some future date with the Gamboys. Right, yeah. <laughs> but, but really, there is this there is this little kind of uh, hobby Trek, yep. that, and they get done up in uh, Pioneer dress. and uh, Except they don't, but fine. They know, get in Pioneer still, looking. They're still wearing their high-tech hiking boots. Yeah, and, it's right. Pioneer looking Gore-Tex. But yeah, this is a that's a huge part of Mormon lore, and it's a huge part of this uh, holiday we'll be celebrating any day here. And yeah, I uh, I you know I I figure if they go on trek, we should all go on trek and just. But if you don't lose a finger, it doesn't count. Can we just drive in an SUV just slowly <laughs> next just to them the whole them. time? <laughs> just just blasting like we are the champions, or, or and we'll say we're those three eighteen year old guys. <laughs> <laughs> That will die later of our injury, 40 years later of our injuries. Of our of river-related injuries. All right. Well, gosh, that's a whole bunch of bullshit. Well, <laughs> yes. Thanks for, uh, thanks for, for giving us that uh, bit of nonsense, and let's move on. Let's move on. Well, Uncle Mark. Yes. Uh, you know, we, the thing, one of the things that keeps us rolling. Yep. Keeps this hand car to moving. <laughs> uh, is uh, is that we have folks uh, that listen to us yep. that give us a little bit of their money. Just give us a little money hug or a little money peck on the cheek. Yeah. From week to week. And it's, it, it is so encouraging, seriously. And we're delighted that it is a thing in our lives. Yeah. It's, uh, it's hashtag it's, blessed. Hashtag blessed. And we've got some folks to thank to that end. Uh, this week, I just we we only got a couple. We're just going to thank Judith and Chris for their fine patronage, and uh, God bless you all. Yeah, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Now, how can they how can they go and do this? Well, you just go to the howtoheretic.com. You click on the Patreon link. And that'll take you to Patreon and make it. Just, it's so simple you can't believe it. You wouldn't even. It's it's just easy breezy beautiful. It's it's easier than being tithed. So just <laughs> throw a little in the collection plate, and uh, we'll thank you for it. And uh, it really helps us do all kinds of stuff. We've got uh, fun stuff planned for the future. That we're yeah. Going now to- that you're back in town, who? Th- Amazing things can happen. Sky's the limit. So if you can't do that, uh, remember, give us a five-star review wherever they have that, or 10 if they've got those, right. and uh, we'll be very, very grateful. Yep. Let's uh, let's do some more show. Let's move on. Well, Uncle Mark. Here I am. Uh, I don't... I. You know, here's the thing. Yeah. Some people make choices in their lives that get them into a situation, and then uh, they need to make other choices. Yeah. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I feel like this is you telling me we're breaking up. Well, I think we need to abort the show. We're going a different direction. So, (laughs) well, you know, we've done, we've done many how to's uh, on, on the show, Dan. And I think some of them have been helpful. Some of them have been, most of them are just dreck. Most of them, most of them are just us blathering, just cutting room floor garbage. But, but we, we do honestly want to, to have conversations with people who are smarter than us to talk about, uh, Things weighty and things not. And uh, today I think we're talking about something that a lot of people would consider weighty. Yes. And uh, we have invited our friend Dr. D here, uh, who is, among many other wonderful things, a an OBGYN, yeah. a, a sex educator, and an abortion provider in a red state here in these United States. And honest to God, Dr. Dr. D, thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you guys so much for having me back. I'm very excited. I've missed you all dearly. I know it's been so long. It's been it's been it's been an age. So so we have invited a, again a person much smarter than we are here to talk about to talk about something that I think we all could continue to talk about in saner ways, and that is 
how to talk about, to think about, to understand. To have an. To have an abortion. Yeah. If if that's something that you have uh, maybe struggled with as an idea or a, a moral conundrum in, in uh, your lifetime. And I think many of us have. So uh, let us let us have a frank discussion about what it is and what it is not. We're going to teach the controversy. <clears throat> and we, when appropriate, Dan and I will mansplain. To Doctor D. Yes, so, indeed. Yes. We'll, we we will do our damnedest to uh, to make sure that our opinions matter the most. Yes, because because what the abortion debate needs is more men. Is yelling more about it. men folk in it? It's uh, <laughs> white men at that. Yeah, we so, couldn't do it without you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Doctor D, uh, what? Where do we start? What is abortion? What are we talking about here? Great question. So, um. Abortion, in strict medical terms, means the ending of a pregnancy. And so abortions can be spontaneous or they can be induced. So spontaneous abortions are miscarriages, or more commonly known as that. Um, And induced abortions are when you cause a pregnancy to end by a variety of means. Um, There's self-induced, and then there's medically induced. So self-induced would be taking medications to try and cause the pregnancy to end, um, you know, Throwing yourself downstairs, a sort of dramatic example, but something that happens. Not recommended. Um, not, not recommended. Imagine. Yes, absolutely not. And really tragic when it does occur because it really is a, a, an instance of last resort for many women. Um, and then there's medical abortions where an abortion is done under the guidance and supervision of a physician. And that can be done using pills. Um, that you take that cause the pregnancy to pass at home, sort of like having a heavy period, or it can be done um, through a simple office-based procedure. Yeah. So, okay. It, this, is a, this is a topic of some controversy in these United States of America and abroad. Um, in part, mostly, I mean, is it mostly just because religious people hate it? Is that is that where we're coming down on this? It is primarily the resistance against abortion primarily does come from a religious community, but one can be religious and um, in favor of the right to choose. Those are not mutually exclusive. Um, right. And there are actually a lot of religious organizations that openly support um, women's rights, women's reproductive rights, including the right to have an abortion. Um, yeah. I just... But I, I, I wanted. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to throw out there that I, in in my little bit of research for this thing, I noticed that uh, I found out that fully a third of Republicans are pro-choice, are 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 in favor of the right to for it for it to be legal in all or most cases. Right. Yeah. And then and then independents and Democrats, it it shoots up. It's like sixty and seventy five percent respectively. Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, your your opinion on abortion is not primarily determined by your political affiliation or your religious affiliation. Mm. Um, the opposition to abortion, you know, it's hard to to pin down the exact reason, but a lot of it comes down to controlling reproduction. Right. And why and, would we want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, so... The ability to control your own reproduction is, you know, a passport to opportunity, um, to growth, to to a world that wouldn't be available to you if you were, you know, forced to continuously become pregnant, to not have access to, to birth control, to not have access to abortion. Um, it would. It's not. It's a ticket to health. Yeah. You know, pre- pregnancy is a, is a stressful time for a woman emotionally, physically, financially, and so the ability to control that aspect of your life opens up this this whole new world. Well, um, I mean, not only some pregnancy, have an interest in controlling that. Not only pregnancy, but like motherhood costs okay. a fortune. Yeah. Yes. Just so uh, being able to choose whether you have a child or not seems to me to be a great boon. Uh, for any woman, yeah, we did a we did a piece. I don't know if you had a chance to listen to it, uh, Doctor D, a, f- a little while ago. That uh, we talked about child brides as a phenomenon in the religious world, and that was a big part of it. Was you know basically having people who are not done being children make more children robs them of any opportunity in life, right? They just yep. a- and so finding a way to a prevent child brides, which is not the subject of this discussion, but basically a way to liberate people from a cycle 
where they're just making more people uh, until they are in a position to choose to do that freely um, is a good thing. Yes. I think, I mean, you completely, you've completely hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think it's, it's about, and it's not just about that individual person. It's about our society as a whole. Um, you know, children are taken care of, the children who do exist. You know, the parents have the capacity to, to love and provide attention and to provide for their children. They have the ability also to provide for themselves and to be complete people and to be to contribute in their own ways to society, to achieve an education, to get a good job. I mean, all of those things are tied into each other. So it's not just about that individual person who is pregnant, but really it's, it's about our success as a society, you know, and it's, um, you know, people who have abortions, um, have them for a variety of reasons. Um, the most common reasons tend to be, Financially, they feel like they cannot support an, a child or another child. You know, two thirds mm. of women who have abortions are already parents. Mm. Um, so, two thirds. Two thirds. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's not you know it's not the the teenager who was irresponsible and didn't think to use birth control or the college student who was you know out hooking up you know it's it's all these like preconceived notions that we have about who has abortions. Um, right. And the reality is is everybody has an abortion, one out of four women. And it, it, it runs the gamut. Um, but most of them are, are mothers and they know what it means to be a parent and to bring a child into this world. And it is a very informed decision that that the bulk of these people are making because they've, they've confronted it before. Right. Absolutely. I find it Indra. Now, one of the things, uh, that, that you, that we sort of talked about in in leading up to this uh, was, the no, the notion that abortion is is healthcare. This isn't. We're not talking about like just a just sort of a a, a a a whim or whatever. This is something that a lot of women that that it's about their health and it's about their well being as people. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think the some people don't want to believe that abortion is healthcare, but you know, it's on an abortion is on the spectrum of the reproductive health cycle that, that people go through. And so, um, the to you cannot, you know, minimize the impact that a pregnancy has on somebody. And so, you know, the decision to become pregnant is a big decision. And if it happens and you are not financially, physically, or emotionally ready to take on, take that on, then the best thing that you can do for your own personal health is to choose to not be pregnant because, and by making that choice, you are furthering your own capacity to be a complete person who who can have a complete life and and what is and what is healthcare but not giving the people the capacity to function at their highest and best self you know and so i you can't separate abortion from healthcare you know it's a woman you know is born goes through puberty menstruates you know become sexually active because we are human and we have sex and that's important and we choose to contracept or not, um, you become pregnant or not. If you become pregnant and you are ready to be pregnant, then you have a child and you continue on. If you become pregnant and you are not ready to have a child, then you have an abortion and you continue on. And maybe then in you finish college and you know in two years you get pregnant or maybe you have an abortion and you wait another two years till you're ready to have your third child because you got that job promotion that you were waiting for that now allows you, you know, it, it's a part of our, our cycle and it's, right. you can't separate it out. Now, one of the arguments that we hear from the anti-abortion uh, side of things is that abortion is dangerous for women, that it's medically unhealthy for them. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. You know, it's an interesting thing that the anti-abortion, um, 
camp tries to they try they sort of talk about, out two sides of their mouth. They try and say that abortion's not health care, but then they try and over regulate it and say that it you know it's dangerous and it should only be done in hospital settings. And and I think you know the reality is is that abortion is incredibly safe. A first trimester abortion is many times safer than a full term pregnancy. Mm, I'll bet. Yeah, I would imagine that's true. And, you know, and a second trimester abortion, even at the latest gestations, is no more dangerous than a full term pregnancy. And I think it's a common misconception that, you know, abortions are safe, are unsafe, that they impact your future fertility. And that's, it's just not true. You know, abortion is one of the safest procedures and the most common procedure that a woman can have in her lifetime. It is, it is uh, in most cases, an outpatient clinic visit procedure, correct? Correct, yes. So you you go in, you come out the same day. It is not major mm-hmm. surgery in most cases. No, procedure takes anywhere from three to about 15 minutes. <laughs> and and <laughs> circling back to what Dan was saying, you know, the there is this incredibly common – these incredibly common um, bits of misinformation that are so in the bloodstream out there that uh, it will cause breast cancer, that it will cause uh, sterility um, uh, and pr- uh, difficulties with, with pregnancies later in life. And those have all been pretty much shown to be bunk. Correct. You know, I spend all day answering questions from people, you know, if I have this procedure, am I going to be able to get pregnant again when I'm ready to? And you know, the truth of the matter is that safe legal abortion does not impact your future fertility. It's an incredibly safe procedure. Um, You can have one, you can have five, you know, uncomplicated abortions do not impact your future fertility. Unsafe abortions can because they carry a risk of complications um, and infection. So when you make abortion illegal and you drive people underground, then you lead people to unsafe abortions that can impact their fertility. Um, So when abortion is accessible and it is safe, then there's not an issue. The breast cancer has been completely debunked. There is no link. We know that giving birth does protect you against breast cancer, um, but having an abortion in and of itself has no impact on that. So, so your, your risk for breast cancer is the same after your abortion as it was before you got pregnant. That is correct. That's interesting. Okay. And, and there's something that I also want to talk about is that the, the incredible commonality of this, of this situation. When uh, you sent me a link to, I believe, a group called Shout Your Abortion, which I really thought was fascinating. And, and it does definitely, uh, you know, it's basically women saying, I'm not ashamed of this. I'm not angry about this. I'm not hurt by this. But also, one in four women before the age of 40, if I read that stat correct, Mm -hmm. uh, will have had an abortion. So everybody knows somebody who's had an abortion. Absolutely. Yes. I just want to, you know, that's that's an interesting point, because the the narrative that we got, and, you know, I grew up in the 80s, and you watch the after school special, and it's meant to be the most tear-jerking, gut-wrenching decision a young woman can make in her life. Oh my God, I am going to have an abortion, and what, what will the Lord think, and what will society think? And I, and also, there's this, there's this narrative out there that all women instantly connect to the, to the, to to the zygote inside of them, and like it will take a part of their soul away if they have this abortion, and. I don't think that that narrative is true. You know, women's experience with abortion are of, as varied as women themselves. And so you can't... So they're all the same then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> as some people would want you to believe. It's, it is a very personal decision, and it is always a personal decision. But it doesn't mean that it's a wrenching decision or it's a sad decision. Um, you know, some women are incredibly empowered by their abortions. You know, it is an opportunity that for them to sort of take control of their of their lives um, and and to decide when and how they will have children. And for some women, it's, it's, it's an easy decision. You know, I got pregnant, I'm not ready to. And so I'm, this is, this is what I choose to do. And this is the best thing for me. And I don't need anybody to tell me differently for Hmm. other women. It's, it can be more challenging. You know, what I hear a lot is I wish I was in a place 
where I could I could carry this pregnancy. Right. You know, I, I wish that I had the support of a partner. I wish that I had the financial resources. I wish that I had the time. I wish that I didn't have this child who already who has so many needs that I can't have another child because I need to focus on the one that I have now. You know, that that sort of that's what I hear. Right. So it, it you know it can be difficult. But it doesn't mean that it's the wrong decision just because right. it was a hard decision. Right. It and it doesn't mean I, I, you're I, bad if you, it wasn't a hard decision. I'm right. sh- I, and I'm sure you know there are those women who are empowered and they're like, "This is not the time for me. If I do it, if I'm, this is going to happen, it's going to happen later." But I'm not doing this now. But I, I'm sure you see like the happy couple that discovers they have a non-viable. Mm-hmm. You know, they wanted to carry the baby to term, but for whatever reason, they're not going to. They shouldn't. And I'm sure that's, you know, very sad and very heartbreaking for them. But it's still, if it's a non-viable fetus, it's still the right decision. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, I think that's, it's an important subset of abortion that it's important to talk about. Um, It is a a small number of the abortions that are performed, but it's a very important aspect. And I think when we talk about abortion, people don't think that it applies to those situations and that the regulations that are passed by states um, don't apply to that situation. But it, but they do. I mean, these types of abortions for fetal anomalies are regulated just in the same way that any other abortion is regulated. So That's when crazy. we talk about these things, these laws that are passed, um, it, it affects any woman who's pregnant and and can't or doesn't want to be. And I think, you know, the the fetal anomalies are particularly heart-wrenching. But I will say that, you know, I, um, you know, we we sometimes talk about elective abortions and indicated abortions. And I think, you know, we really need to move away from that language. You know, that an indicated abortion is if it's, you know, for the maternal health or if there's a fetal anomaly and then everything else is kind of those elective abortions. But there's not really a such thing as an elective abortion. Every abortion has an indication. The indication being that that person who is pregnant does not want to be pregnant anymore. And that's Mm. your indication. And their reason is valid, whatever that reason is. And why the hell, as a society, would we want any child being born into an environment where it can't be cared for or the person doesn't want to care for it? Why would we want that as a society? That's madness. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something that we really need to examine. I think when we talk about, you know, the the anti-abortion movement, you know, what is the end goal here? Because really, you know, they're not pro-life, they're certainly pro-birth, but if, if these people were passing laws that mandated paid parental leave and affordable daycare, you know, I'm, my patient numbers would probably drop in half. You know, if people right. had access to to contraception at, you know, readily available a method of their choice at a reasonable cost, you know, my numbers would drop in half. But we we pass these policies that that make it so much harder to parent and and then we vilify women for having abortions. Yeah, it it's it this was what something that drives me completely berserk, which is, you know, occasionally I will have to tip my hat to say the Catholic Church, mm-hmm. which I know this. I'm on very thin ice saying this, but <laughs> they're like anti-abortion, but they're also anti-war and they're anti-capital punishment. And I'm like, okay, there's some, there's some. I can see a thread of consistency through this idea that life, in whatever form you describe it, is sacred. Mm-hmm. But with this, with the screamers on the other side of the debate in this country, who are screaming misinformation, who are screaming at at women who have made a choice, whether it was hard or not, to walk into a clinic and are protected by the First Amendment for this screaming at these women who might be in a really, who might be in crisis, which is just insane to me. It's like screaming at people going to get chemotherapy. What the fuck is wrong with you? Um, They are pro-birth. This is, they they fight sex education in schools. They fight contraception. Uh, They won't let their their girls get the uh, uh, HPV vaccination. It's insane. And then, and then the second that fetus draws breath, it's on its own. It's on its own. Fuck you. Right. There's no. We don't care about you anymore. They're cutting WIC. They're cutting. You know, uh, pre-K. They're cutting any possibility that would help this woman and child look, together have a have a fighting chance. Look, Uncle Mark. If yeah. 
if an infant can't pull itself up by its own bootstraps, <laughs> yeah. then what are we even doing here? If it didn't inherit a million dollars, then fuck it, right? So, <laughs> right. But yeah, that's uh, if there was a consistency in the other side, I would at least have to tip my hat a little bit. Right. But there just simply is not, and. So you you know you can you as a sex educator I'm sure you have plenty to say about the state of sex education in this country and the access to contraception. Yeah, I mean it's abysmal and I think you know we have such a uh, such a, a wrong approach to to sexuality. We're still such puritans at heart where you know we don't want to talk about sex, we don't want to talk about birth control, we don't want to talk about abortion. Um, and we vilify people, you know, I think ultimately sex, preg- pregnancy and abortion is proof that somebody has had sex, right? You, you know, and, and it's an opportunity to, to vilify these people. And, and, and the shame comes down on the woman because she is the, is the visible bearer of that, of, of that shame, shame of yeah. sex. And, and I think we, we just, you know, hopefully one day we'll be able to move past that and, and talk about sex in a healthier manner. I mean, we know that if you, if you can have engaged conversations with young people about sex and safe sex, that they're more likely to delay first intercourse. They're more likely to use contraception at their first episode of intercourse. You know, those are all things that we should strive for, but yet we just choose to to shame people. And a lot of the, the struggle that I see in people with abortion relates to that external stigma and shame that they that they carry and they perceive from other people. Yeah. I it it, it baffles me. I you know I get here's the thing that doesn't baffle me. I understand that a lot of people believe and I actually sympathize with this. A lot of people believe that a human being is being killed in this process. And to me that I'd like if if I believed that, man, I I would be horrified by by the concept of abortion, I think. But th- I mean, is that what's happening? It's you know, I think <laughs> It's such a, it's such an, we're sort of entering into sort of a philosophical argument at this point. And, yeah. you know, what is life and, you know, and, and what is a, a person? And so, you know, an embryo has the capacity to become a person if that pregnancy is continued and results in a birth. So, you know, is that a life? It's a yeah. life or it's a potential life. I mean, I consider it to be a life, but I think the question that it comes down to is whose life do you value more? Do you right. value the life of the person who is pregnant or do you value the life of the fetus? Right. And and I will say that if you think you're valuing the life of the fetus over the mother or as parallels with them – Ultimately, if you're forcing this person to carry a pregnancy and to, to have a child that they do not feel they have the capacity to do, how is that valuing the life of the fetus ultimately? Right. And you're, you're, you're valuing – it's a fetishization, I think, on, on – That's it, clever. You know, it, it is. It's a fetishization that, that comes from – religious, you know, even if people aren't doing it, if it isn't directly religious, it is so part of Mm -hmm. the American culture that there is this, that women are this slightly different class of people who must Mm -hmm. be servile at the same time that they're put on a pedestal, meaning therefore that they are really shouldn't be in charge of these decisions. But, but you're asking, you're you're valuing uh, a a pre-human, a something that has the potential to be human, over the person that is going to be on the hook for at least 18 years. And is already a human. And is already right. a human. Undeniably yes. already Undeniably, a human. Undeniably, yes. Yes. And this is the thing, when we talk about pregnancy, and the fetishization is really, you know, it, that, I'm glad that you brought that up because we, we think of pregnancy as this, you know, rosy-cheeked, round belly, radiant woman. Oh, it you looks know. like pure hell to me. I don't know how- <laughs> Oh you know, God. and then the, the rosy cheek little baby cooing in the pictures and the cute little outfits. And, you know, nobody shows you that, you know, the swollen feet, the vomiting, the, right. the hypertension, the diabetes, the prolonged labor that ends up in a C-section and the sleepless nights of the colicky baby who, you know, won't sleep. And, and you know... It, People forget about that. I mean, so I remember, I'll tell you a story. When I was a second year resident in obstetrics and gynecology, I had dinner with my old college roommate who had just found out she was pregnant. And we were talking about it during dinner. And she stops at one point and she goes, 
bad things don't ever happen to pregnant people, do they? (laughs) (laughs) What? (laughs) And I mean, she was a college educated, smart woman. And I just, you know, it was just one of those things where my just jaw dropped on the floor and thought, oh my gosh, you have no idea, you know? And she went on to have a beautiful pregnancy and hers was great, but that was was one person's experience. And there is not... It, it just it, it I had never it had never occurred to me that people didn't see or understand the realities of childbirth. I mean, and I think it, if you haven't been pregnant, you don't understand. And even if you have, maybe you you got lucky. <laughs> right. It is the craziest system of making more people. <laughs> I <laughs> cannot believe this is how we do it. We really, we really need to go to an external egg based system. I think. <laughs> a, a, it, it's a much better... We need to be oviviparous as a species. 100%. <laughs> yeah. I think so. I, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, because we were, we were sort of headed in this direction anyway, just really quickly, is just one of the most, one of the most interesting uh, uh, points of this conversation. You were talking about valuing the life of the woman, valuing the life of the fetus. There's a, a, a bodily autonomy argument that needs to be discussed. There's, there's, there's this notion that women if it you know if they are not allowed abortions are being forced to use their body to support another person's body and we don't have the right to ask that of another person agreed yeah Yeah, completely completely i mean we you know it's one of those i someone likened it to like well you are a technical you, you know you're a match as a liver donor, so you have to donate your liver, right? Right, or whatever. Yeah. Like you, we don't have the right to ask one person to use their body to save another body. That's not that's not a right that this other body has. Absolutely. And I think that that gets to what is kind of ironic about this whole conversation is, I think, and you guys can tell me if you disagree with this. I already do. That that I think if if you are a man. You have basically really nothing to say about this unless someone you are intimately involved in is carrying a child that you have some involvement with. I think then you have an opinion. Mm-hmm. I think outside of that, you don't. And do you think I'm wrong? Well, I think even then, like, there's an ultimate opinion that the woman has. I think you have that trumps an, you. Yes. I think you have yeah. an opinion. Yeah. You, you get to yeah. say your opinion at that point. Yes. You have an opinion. You don't, you don't get to make the final decision. I t- 100% agree with that. Right. But, but absolutely. I, absolutely. You have an opinion. And I think for people who, who go through those who are in relationships, they want to have this discussion right. with their partner. They, they want to, it's important to be able to kind of talk through that whole process. I mean, it's an important part of a relationship to have that communication and, and an unintended pregnancy can have a really profound impact on a relationship and you should have an opinion about it. But right. ultimately it's, it's your partner's choice, not yours. I totally agree. And so if you're a, if you're a man standing outside an abortion clinic or, or, a, or a medical provider screaming at a complete stranger, you are wrong. Right. <laughs> you are wrong well, to be doing that. Frankly, if you are outside of any clinic screaming at anyone seeking any kind of medical attention, you're already wrong. <laughs> you're already you're it doesn't it doesn't matter if they're looking for an abortion or if they're, you know, looking to get their abscessed tooth taken care what of. What if you hate tonsillectomies? Well, and you <laughs> want to stop that from happening. I mean, <laughs> yes, it's it's that absurd. It's so silly. At some point and 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 this is, I think, maybe a place to take the conversation is, I sympathize. Dan said this earlier. And if you, like you said, if what you believe is happening because of whatever, misinformation or, or bullshit or something in the Bible that you shouldn't be reading anyway because it's a dreck, if you think what's happening is a viable baby is being killed, I understand that you would be animated about that. Yeah. So even, you know, to our to our friends leaving religion, we have a lot of people who are leaving religion or post-religion who I think are still struggling with this issue. Struggle with it as you must, but remember what we were talking about earlier is other people's bodily autonomy. Yeah. Le- yeah. Understand that your struggling with it is not their fucking problem. And and take the take a moment to try and imagine what that situation is like of of becoming pregnant. 
and really knowing that this is not right for you for for whatever reason. That this you is know, a life altering event that's occurred. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How would you how would you feel that? And can you can you empathize with a woman's dis- or I should say a person because you know trans men have abortions too. Mm. Um, so I don't want to be exclusionary but to, w- with a person who who is going through that, take a moment to try and empathize with that decision. I tell, I tell my patients all the time, abortion is, I think, an incredibly loving decision. What mm. more loving decision to say to, that I cannot be the parent that I know I need to be or I should be. And so I am choosing to end this pregnancy so that if and when I am ready to parent in the future, I can be in the best possible situation in order to do that. I think there is nothing selfish about abortion. I think it is an incredibly loving decision. And I think people should embrace that. Yeah, well, I think on I think that is a lovely note to end this conversation on. We'll probably have more conversations in the future, but uh, thank you, Doctor D, so much for sorting us out on this issue. Yeah, thank you, thank you for having this discussion. I mean, I think we should we should continue to talk about abortion. It is a real thing, and if you think you don't know anybody who's had an abortion, that's because they've just chosen not to tell you because they're afraid because of all this social shame and all the yeah. garbage that that surrounds it, so. or because it's none of your goddamn business. <laughs> Also that. <laughs> well, I will. I will include uh, several of the links that you provided to us, uh, Doctor D. That includes some really, really interesting stats and uh, and some other information and maybe some resources. So, yeah. um, and we certainly invite listeners to you know chime in and let us know about their experiences and their opinions because I think this is something as a community, as a skeptical post religious community, we still have a lot of work to do. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So and we need again. to talk about it. Yep. All right. Thanks, Dr. D. Thank you, guys. Okay, bye. Moving on. Well, friends, that's it for this week's show. Hey, listen, we'd love to hear from you. Go ahead and send us an email if you like. uh, Howto at howtoheretic.com. Or if you would prefer to leave uh, an anonymous or otherwise voicemail about your experience with abortion or whatever else, please do at uh, 903-88-HOW-2, which is 903-884-6986. Yeah, or if you want to know about, if you want us to know about your trek across across the wilderness with a handcart, uh, just go ahead and tweet at How to Heretic. Yes, tweet from from where you're sitting in 1855. Yes, indeed. And uh, you know, Dan's also occasionally on Facebook, so go there and encourage him to do more. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much again to once again to our patrons, and thanks Cody Layton for editing the show. And thank you all of you, dear friends, for tuning in. Bye-bye, friends. Ciao.